In a new twist, court stops Aminu Adobayero from parading himself as Emir, orders police to eject him from royal residence. Tribunal affirms Ododo as Kogi governor as court rejects Shaibu's lawsuit on PDP primary in Edo. As the world celebrates Children's Day, President Tinubu vows to secure Nigeria's future. And on the foreign scene, early voting begins in South African elections that could spell end of ANC dominance. Hello and welcome to Trust News Hour tonight. I am Eugenia Abu. A Kano High Court presided by Justice Amina Aliyu on Monday stopped the five deposed emirs of Kano from parading themselves as emirs. The case was filed by the Kano State Attorney General, Speaker of the Kano State House of Assembly, as well as the House of Assembly against the five emirs. The deposed emir of Kano, Aminu Bayero, has been parading himself as emir and occupying the Nasarawa Royal Residence after his title holders, Aminu Baba Dangangudi, secured a federal high court order restraining Kano State government from enforcing a new law that dethroned the monarchs. Joining us now via phone to discuss the developments in Kano from a legal perspective is Barrister Abba Hikima. Hello, Barrister Hikima. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, explain to our viewers this apparent legal conundrum that is unfolding in Kano. Can one court injunction trump another? Well, it appears to be a conundrum, but actually to legal mind, it is a very settled matter. Every legal mind is aware that where you have two conflicting court orders, one asking you to do something and another court order asking you to do another action that is entirely conflicting with the first one, what you do in that instance is that you look at the timing of the two orders and then you follow the one that is first in time. This is a very simple, although or really it is not as simple as it sounds, but in this case, because we are dealing with expertise orders, orders secured or given by court to one of the parties, each of these uh, orders was only given to one of the parties. When the first order was given, it was given to Babata, to San Agundi, who uh, at that time the Kano State government was not consulted, was not heard. And this time around, when the uh, Kano State High Court also handed down another order, it did not consult or hear from the other area or the other party. So they are called expertise orders. In this kind of situation, you simply take the first in time. Well, is there a jurisdictional case to be made here looking at the contradiction between the order of the Federal High Court and the injunction by the Kano State High Court? Yes, really there are jurisdictional issues. Uh, and uh, myself, I'm aware, and of course other legal minds have spoken about this, issues of chief county and issues of any council of Kano State or even any other state is a matter within the jurisdictional competence of the High Court of those states it is also a matter that pertains to the state. The governor of Kano State and the Kano State House of Assembly have more power on the issue over, you know, uh, the federal government or federal court. Because normally the federal, uh, federal court entertain issues that are chiefly federal matters, federal offenses, and then matters that fall under Section 215 of the Constitution, which are clearly almost all the time federal, federal uh, you know, causes and matters. But in this case, because uh, an order is given to security agencies, for example, in the first order, there was a deliberate and specific order of the Federal High Court to the security agencies that they should act as they maintain peace and the Kano, and that they should ma maintain status quo antebellum, which means they shouldn't give effect to that new law. That order, whether it is rightly given or wrongly given, uh, must be obeyed until the proper legal procedures are followed to set aside that order. Nobody has the right to just, you know, take a look at, at, at an order of court and say, this court does not have jurisdiction, and so for that reason, I'm not going to obey the, the court, the court order. If you open this window, every court order will be flouted, 
people begin to raise jurisdictional issues where, where there, are, there are none. And that is why it is a settled matter in law everywhere, even to uh, I mean, law students, that court orders, whether rightly or wrongly given, must be obeyed until it is legally and formally set aside. And that is why I think, and I very much believe that the first order given, regardless of whether it is given with jurisdiction or not, must be obeyed until and unless that same court sets aside. Federal High Court and State High Court are courts of coordinate jurisdiction. No one of them can set aside the decision of another. Canon State High Court cannot set aside the order given by the high, Federal High Court. And the Federal High Court also cannot set aside anything done by State High Court. If you have any problem, you appeal their decisions to the Court of Appeal. Therefore, in this case, since there is an obvious and apparent conflict, you take the first in time, and that is uh, also a very settled uh, you know, elementary legal, legal issue. And that's where we have to leave it there. We want to thank you, Barista Abahikima, for joining us on NewsHour on Trust TV. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. After over a week of shutting down and laying siege on the popular Banex Plaza in the Wusetu area of Abuja, the military has reopened the market for business. Checks by Trust TV revealed that the plaza resumed operations around 2.30 in the afternoon on Monday. Recall that the market was sealed by military authorities on May the 18th following a violent clash between traders and military personnel. Trouble started when thugs beat up some soldiers who had a disagreement with a trader in the plaza. The trader had reportedly sold a bad phone to someone who invited soldiers. Rather than resolve the issue amicably, the trader reportedly invited thugs who assaulted the uniformed men. Although the police stepped in to resolve the situation, soldiers later stormed the plaza, forcing traders to shut down immediately. Human rights activists, including Femi, Falano, SAN, civil society organizations, among others, had condemned the military action. The Kogi State Governorship Election Petition Tribunal, sitting in Abuja, on Monday affirmed the election victory of Governor Usman Ududu of All Progressives Congress APC in the November 11th, 2023 poll. The three-member panel of justices, headed by Justice Ado Bernunkudu, held that the petition against Ududu's election was bereft of substance and accordingly dismissed it. The tribunal held that the petitioners, the Social Democratic Party, SDP, and its candidate, Mutala Ajaka failed to prove the allegations of overvoting and non-compliance with the Electoral Act 2022 in the petition. The panel, in a unanimous decision, held that all the witnesses' evidence filed before it were incompetent and full of inconsistencies. It also agreed with the submissions of the respondents that the allegations of forgery raised in the petition were pre-election matter, which ought to have been raised 14 days after the documents were submitted to the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC. In the meantime, a federal high court in Abuja has rejected a lawsuit filed by Philip Schwaibu, the impeached deputy governor of Edo State, seeking to invalidate the governorship primary of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, held on February the 22nd in the state. The primary saw Aswe Igodalo emerge as the winner in Benin City, in delivering the judgment, Justice James Omotosho ruled on Monday that Shuaibu lacked the legal standing to challenge the primary's outcome as he did not participate fully in it and was absent from the venue on the day of the event. The judge further deemed Shuaibu's lawsuit premature as he did not utilize the internal dispute resolution mechanism within the PDP before resorting to court. Emphasizing Shuaibu's obligation as a party member to abide by the PDP's rules and regulations, Justice Omotosha stated that aggrieved aspirants must first seek recourse through the party's appeal committee before pursuing legal action. The judge also noted ample evidence supporting Igodalo's victory in the primary. The Nigerian Safety Investigation Bureau, NSIB, says it has commenced an investigation into a train derailment that occurred on Sunday at Jerry Station. The incident involved a passenger train en route to Idu Station, Abuja, from the Rigasa Station, Kaduna. In a statement, a spokesperson for the NSIB, Bimbo Ladeji, said preliminary fact-finding 
undertaken by investigators reveals that the train, while navigating a switch point north of Jerry Station, the Bureau said the baggage van and one passenger coach derailed. The derailed coaches were then dragged appro approximately 86 feet from the switch point before coming to a stop. Two drivers, two train guards, three traveling ticket collectors, 20 police escorts, and four bomb disposal unit members were on board the train alongside passengers. The Bureau said no passenger or crew members were injured as all passengers safely disembarked and were transported with the rare locomotive and the remaining eight coaches to Abuja. The Federal High Court in Abuja has scheduled May 29th for the trial of Belo Borejo, the detained leader of Mieti Allah Kautal Hori, after dismissing his bail related to terrorism charges. Justice Inyang Ekwo fixed the trial date following the dismissal of the bail request. During the last court session, the trial was set for ruling and commencement, but Bodejo's but Bodejo's absence delayed proceedings. However, after fixing the trial date, Bodejo's counsel, Ahmed Raji, affirmed his client's readiness for trial, indicating that they wouldn't appeal the bail, bail ruling since the court prioritized an expeditious hearing. Bodejo, arrested by the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, faces charges of unlawfully establishing an ethnic militia group, Kungia Zamanlapia, for promoting terrorism. The Attorney General of the Federation filed three counts against him under the Terrorism Prevention and Prohibition Act 2022, to which he pleaded not guilty. Before the bail ruling, Bodejo's lawyer argued for his client's release on grounds including ill health and fundamental rights violation, but the judge dismissed the application. A coalition of ethnic nationalities under the ages of the Ataka Birom, Irigwe, Mwambu, and Ron Youth Association, in conjunction with the coalition of Plateau indigenous youth bodies, have raised the alarm over what they described as forceful displacement and taking over 151 of their communities by bandits. The coalition disclosed this on Monday during a press conference in Jos, the Plateau state capital. Ado Musa completes that report. The chairman of the group, Paul Delica, who led the coalition, said their people have been displaced daily from their homes, lamenting that many of their houses have been taken over by the bandits. According to him, the coalition is disappointed over the lack of response from various stakeholders, including the government, explaining that hundreds of communities in Basa, Bokos, Riom, Barikiladi among local government areas have been scattered by the attacks. Magavul and Ron Youth Association in conjunction with the coalition of plateau indigenous youth bodies are constrained to draw attention of the public and especially international communities through uh, this press conference on the alarming and unacceptable loss uh, of ancestral land as well as the denial of access to farmlands and mining, uh, mining site currently being suffered by the customary landowners in the state. For several years to date, the youth bodies have been crying about the activities complaining to appropriate authorities, including the Nigerian Police, Department of DSS, Operation Self Heaven, uh, National Human Rights Commission, the National Assembly, and others that there is a serious under, undercurrent to the unprecedented and well orchestrated terror attack unleashed on our hamlets, villages, communities, with the principal motive of uh, disposing us of our God given land. Chairman of Biramud Mullers Association, Solomon Montiri, while responding to questions during the conference, Call on both the federal and state governments to ensure peace in their communities. For the first time in Nigeria, and our situation in particular, that there will be attack on villages and communities, and we'll see rapid response, except now. But if it were in those days, the whole community will be overrun, and nothing will ever happen. And then we'll hear that government is on top of the situation, which we have never seen. 
But this time around, we have seen rapid response, and that is why we are commending the present administration of uh, President Bola Metinibu and that of Barisa Kale Mutfam for uh, creating an enabling environment for the security to work, and we are seeing results. The coalition, while calling for more actions by the federal government to secure their villages, also appealed to other individuals to provide assistance to those who have been displayed from their homes. Adomusa, Trust TV News, Joss. Governor Hyacinth Alia of Benra State has taken a bold step by signing an executive order aimed at addressing various societal challenges in the state. The order prohibits open grazing, open defecation, urination and other offences such as loitering, overspeeding and overloading of vehicles. The executive order, based on constitutional provisions and public order laws, outlines strict measures to ensure public safety and sanitation. Effective from February 28, 2024, the order makes loitering during late hours, indiscriminate waste disposal, and obstruction of roads punishable offenses. Additionally, the order prohibits farming on public land, unauthorized construction, and hawking on roadsides. It also mandates obtaining permits for public gatherings beyond 10 o'clock in the night. Governor Alia's executive order demonstrates a commitment to upholding law and order while promoting a cleaner and safer environment for residents of Benue State. Commercial motorcycle operators, popularly known as Okada riders, on Monday invaded the Ikpaja police station in Lagos State. The invasion led to a gun battle between the Okada riders who were armed with dangerous weapons and the policemen on ground. The incident caused panic among residents, leading to the reinforcement of police personnel. Spokesperson for the Lagos State Police Command, SP Benjamin Hundei, confirmed the incident, saying the situation had been brought under control. In the meantime, the Lagos State Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources on Monday commenced the removal of shanties and illegal business structures under the Jora Bridge in fulfillment of the Cleaner Lagos Initiative. The State's Commissioner for Environment and Water Resources, Tokumba Wahab, in a video post on X, said the demolition of the shanties was done in accordance with the law. This followed a 24-hour notice served on the illegal occupants and business operators squatting under bridges by operatives of the Lagos State Environmental Sanitation Corps. In a statement issued earlier by the Director of Public Affairs in the Lagos Waste Management Authority for Lashade Kadiri, the government had announced its intention to clear illegal squatters from the Ijara under bridge over environmental concerns. The government said it was imperative to carry out the evacuation of the bridge and other illegal structures across the state. Officers of the Nigerian Immigration Service, NIS, who are on foreign missions in different countries abroad, have lamented the non-payment of the allowances since December last year. The officers who have been united by their common plight have come together under one umbrella to voice out their ordeal. One of the officers said besides the non-payment of the allowances since December last year, the one of October and November last year were only paid in March this year. Outlining the allowances to include housing, health, utility, among others, the officer said the situation has seriously caused them hardship, prominent among which is that some of them are already having challenges in paying their rents. The officer who pointed out that the payment of rent are monthly, unlike in Nigeria, which is yearly, also noted that the money they pay is from about $2,000 and above, adding that many of the officers are already having issues with their landlords. You're watching News Hour on Trust TV coming up after the break. 
Local government administration back in public debate as federal government begins litigation. More news after the break. Do stay. Thank you for rejoining us. This is News Hour on Trust TV. Another look at our top stories. In a new twist, court stops Aminu Adobayero from parading himself as Emir orders police to eject him from royal residence. And tribunal affirms Ududu as Kogi governor as court rejects Shaibu's lawsuit on PDP primary in Edo. And moving on now, President Bola of the family unit as a place where sacred values of honesty, modesty, hard work and charity are passed down to future generations. The president also affirmed that society is a reflection of each family unit as a collective urging the preservation of those principles that make for a wholesome, nurturing and thriving nation. In a statement by spokesman Ajuri Ngelale to mark this year's Children's Day, the president stated that his administration is sparing no effort in ensuring that Nigeria's children have a solid footing for the realization of their dreams. Ngelale noted that with increased investments in education and the recent overhauling of the entire education system to provide both human and material resources for learning, as well as the efforts of the National Commission for Almagery and Out-of-School Children, the president is expanding access to qualitative education for all Nigerians. President Tinubu reassured the nation of his commitment to ensuring a safe and secure ambience of learning for the children while improving the standard of education. Children in Kaduna State to look into the children in the country with a view to initiating policies that will address the menace. The children made the appeal during the celebration of the 2024 International Children's Day in the state. Trust TV's Bello Musa has that report. It is a convergence of hundreds of children at the Murtala Muhammad Square, Kaduna, for the celebrating of their day. <laughs> I am happy to, to for this day that children happy children day. I am happy, very happy. I'm very happy, most especially when I saw our deputy governor because she interacts with us very well. And also we mix with other students in this school. We see many students from different schools which we mix together and we interact with them. I'm very happy that today is Children's Day. I feel happy and I was excited and it went well. I feel, feel joy, I feel very excited. Because it's Children's Day and it's a special day for us to be happy. The children are concerned about the manners of out-of-school children, which is rising with each passing day. Ha, that one is even... It's heartbreaking because whenever I'm coming to school and I see some other students not coming, like it really breaks my heart. At times I even shed tears, wishing that something will just be done for them to be in school. Children face many problems, which lead them to what? To begging after because they are they are not educated. They didn't know what is yes, they didn't know yes is there, they didn't know what is no. Which lead them to begging because they didn't have the knowledge. They have not ever been in school. So I will I will I will be very happy if the government will still do that also. I won't lie to you, I feel very bad, very, very bad because seeing me going to school and my friends or my uh, sisters and brothers they are not going to school, it's not really good. So we need, the government needs to help us about it so that some that they are not in school they can be able to get and know the uh, importance of education because education is really good, it's really, really important. It is a day where children of Nigeria and Kaduna State are being celebrated. The Kaduna State governor, represented by his deputy, Hadiza Balarabe, says the day is to reflect on the challenges facing children with a view to addressing them. As we celebrate Children's Day, we must also draw attention to the pressing issues of child labor and child trafficking, which remains prevalent in our society. These practices are abhorrent and must be condemned in the strongest terms. Every child has the right to a safe and happy childhood. 
the event reflects on the plight of children, not just within the state, but across the world, with a view to improving their lives for a scared future. Bella Musa, Trust TV News Kaduna. I'm from Kaduna. We go to Bochi, where parents have urged the state government to include entrepreneurship skills in schools' curricula to enable students leave school with relevant skills. They made the demand while speaking with Trust TV at the 2024 Children's Day celebration held at the Abubakar Tafa Walewa Stadium, Bochi. Trust TV's Adamu Imam has the rest of the story. This year's Children's Day celebration in Bochi State witnessed an unprecedented number of attendees, including parents, guardians, as well as government officials and other dignitaries from across the state. Representatives of secondary and primary schools, as well as other youth organizations, participated in the colorful march past, witnessed by guests, parents and teachers who all asked for a restructuring of the syllabus to include more school extra activities. <laughs> Like uni, uh, union for teachers to encourage other, uh, other schools to emulate it. Uh, for example, I have seen press club, yeah? an entrepreneurship club in that school of this intention. All they could do, they did all their best to make sure that students become very happy today. And we thank God the representatives of the government are here, the Commissioner for Women Affairs, she is also here. So you can see the, the smiles of the faces of our children today. The challenges we are facing is that no normal support from the community. Secondly, we are now tabling our support to the state government who supported us by establishing this school by giving us more support like scholastic materials which we are lacking uniform all these are all our challenges some of them don't even have exercise our students Meanwhile, the state government says it will redouble effort to turn around the education sector for the good of all. Adam Imam, Trust TV News, Bauchi. Thank you for the Day celebration. The people in a related development, residents of Benue State have called for greater investment in programs and policies geared towards advancing the cause of children in the state. This, they said, will help address issues around rising cases of child labor and abuse, which have been recently reported in the state. Jimmy Adzande reports that they were speaking on the sidelines of this year's Children's Day celebration. Here's his report. It is their day, and they are indeed happy to meet outside the classes for merriment. While some kids have the opportunity to celebrate like this, many others are roaming the streets in urban settings, struggling for survival. Of course, there are kids, there are children that are in the, that are in the streets, moving up and down, that, that do not have the opportunity to be enrolled. And if you look at the, them, some of them, if you, if you ask them, they will tell you, and they, what they will tell you is that they, they will communicate to you in such a way that their parents don't have the financial uh, know-how to be able to enroll them. And if they have that opportunity to be enrolled, they will also do better. If you are not educated, you will, it will be difficult for you to have a nice place in the society today. Even the rich, those people that are rich today and are illiterate, they are finding it very difficult to cope when it comes to the level of expressing themselves. So I am advising on this day that um, children who do not have uh, parents, it is good that all of us should stand up and help them. Nobody knows what the future holds. Residents feel the government and public spirited individuals are not doing enough at the moment for the kids. Others say the kids are not properly educated, 
the future of the country is not guaranteed, as children are believed to be the leaders of tomorrow. There are some parents in town that are capable, that have the means to sponsor these children in school. So those that are doing well, that they know that they can help these children in their own little way, I would like to call upon them and advise that they should help some of these children that don't have the opportunity to go to school, so that they can be a better children in future and their future will be brighter because they say that education is the key to success. I would advise that the government should help, call upon them to give them little work that they will be doing, like handwork, to engage in handwork so that they will be able to like become good citizens in future, not just be roaming about on the street. Anybody that has something to help the children that don't have anybody to help them as they go to school or learn handwork, the person should help by putting the child into school, any school, public school or private. Highlights of the occasion were much past and other extracurricular activities by the young learners in various schools why some converge at public squares. This year's theme is For Every Child, Every Right. Jimmy Azandi, Trust TV News, Makodi. Nigerians have been reacting to the federal government's decision to challenge what it calls the unilateral, arbitrary, and unlawful remo removal of democratically elected local government area chairmen by governors, among other requests. With the Supreme Court set to commence hearing in the suit this Thursday, Noel Thompson reports that stakeholders have been speaking on how the governor's conduct has affected the development of local governments. Here's Noel's report. Other requests by the federal government are an order stopping governors from constituting caretaker committees to run the affairs of local governments and an injunction restraining the governors, their agents and previews from receiving spending or temporary with funds released from the Federation account for local governments. As this expert says, it is the right way to go. So seeing the federal challenging their colleagues at the state level, who they will always need, especially when elections come, you know, demanding that they should obey the constitution as it stipulates in the 1990 constitution that, that, that the local government, which is the third tier of government, must have a democratic system, which has not been in place. And frankly, our constitution does not in any way recognize all of these caretaker committees, which is what we see, which is the order of the day across the states. So the federal government asking and demanding that the autonomy of the local government must be put in place is a very positive, very positive development. Constitutionality of local government council is concerned. It says a system of local government by a democratically elected, the catchword is democratically, elected local government councils is hereby guaranteed. The second you know, leg you know, of that section uh, 7, it goes further to say accordingly, the state governments should establish state laws that will see to the structure, composition, administration, and finances you know, of the local governments. So this is where the states you know, get their constitutional powers from. But the constitutional power does not limit them to go and dissolve a democratically elected local government council. He also spoke about how the governor's conduct have affected the development of local governments as a third tier of government. So you see the governor's controlling all the resources, which is illegal. So we have people who we've seen are Democrats doing very undemocratic things. I said, God, the, the, what we call joint accounts, in the States they call it jack where all the money comes to the governors and then they now decide what they spend and what they don't spend, is the reason, is what has dwarfed development across Nigeria. If they tell you the story of some states, you will weep, you know, for the local governments. They just make them to be mere salary payers. And then and, and you, you won't see any development, you know, on ground. Some F-50 residents also spoke on the subject matter. Some of these governors, they use local government funds to help themselves to execute some pro a program. Where some local governments are lying value and they are sovereign. Uh, it's a very positive move in the right direction because it's already in the constitution. The local government areas are the third uh, sector, tier of the uh, uh, level of government and they are supposed to be autonomous. I think it's a good step. It's something that has 
that is long overdue as a matter of fact. A substantial level of autonomy at local government levels is important for the promotion of grassroots democracy and self-rule among various diverse interests that make up the national polity. Well, Samson, Trust TV News, Abuja. Borno State Governor Baba Ganazulum has commended President Bola Tenubu for supporting the state with food palliatives to cushion the effects of the economic hardships in the state. He stated this during the official handover of food items for vulnerable persons in the state. The Director General of the National Emergency Management Agency, represented by the Borno Zonal Officer Mohamed Aji, said the President directed the presentation of bags of maize, millet and sorghum to the state as part of the federal government's renewed hope agenda to reduce hunger among the population. Meanwhile, Governor Zulum appreciated President Tinubu and assured that the food palliatives will be distributed to the most vulnerable communities in the state. The President, I want to assure the Federal Minister of Agriculture, I want to assure Myanmar that these food items shall be distributed to the most vulnerable population. I want to also assure you that no any direction will be found in Bono State. These properties will be strictly and meticulously distributed to the deserving people of Bono State. But apart from the good items, we have been receiving a lot of support from the federal government. And I think it's better for us to acknowledge the support, not only in the area of food support, but we are also receiving additional funding from the federal government in order to strengthen the resilience of the community. We will recall that the improvement of this response to reduce the impact of the current economic downturn being experienced to the country in line with the civil war agenda. Mr. President approved the leader for the two metric tons of associated food commodities from the National Strategic Place itself under the control of the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Security. The associated food commodities include maize, millet, sorghum, and garlic. This includes the product after sharing the commodities and successfully transporting the uh, quantities allocated to produce it. Today we are here to hand over the items to produce the government for distribution to the deserving beneficiaries. And now to aviation. The federal government has indefinitely suspended the Air Nigeria Airline project. Minister of Aviation and Aerospace, Festus Keamu, announced this at the ministerial briefing to mark the first year of the Tinubu administration. He said the airline was never a Nigerian airline, but an attempt to use a foreign airline to pose as a Nigerian national airline. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tajuddin Abbas, and the Minister of Blue Economy, Buega Uyitola, say the establishment of a shipping regulatory agency in the country is a step in the right direction. They disclosed this on Monday at a public hearing on the Shipping Council's repeal and enactment of the Shippers Council and Economic Regulatory Bill. The Speaker, alongside other stakeholders, lauded the regulatory agency noting that the bill when passed into law will ensure the protection of rights, competitiveness and enhance ease of doing business at the ports. This reenactment bill not only seeks to ensure that the proposed agency establishes an economic regulatory framework for effective and efficient regulation of commercial and related activities in the shipping and port sector, but also aims to create an enabling environment for private sector participation in the provision and operation of regulated services in Nigeria, amongst others. We know in the aviation sector, regulator is there. Communication sector, regulator is there. In the power sector, regulator is there. In the upstream sector, regulator is there. In the downstream sector, you have regulator. I mean, all, um, all the economic sectors have regulators with the exception of the shipping services. So I think this is one more reason why we even have to double our efforts uh, to make sure that this bill sees the light of the day at the shortest possible time by God's grace. This week, the Chinese embassy in Nigeria 
launched the 2024 Chinese Film Festival in Abuja. The event, themed Harmony in Diversity, aims to showcase a blend of different cultures, voices, perspectives, and opinions. Emphasizing Nollywood's importance to China, the event highlighted that the Chinese film market will become more accessible to Nollywood productions. The platform is set to enhance cultural exchange and cooperation in the film industry between Nigeria and China. The purpose of this uh, film festival is, uh, you know, first uh, to promote uh, the cultural exchange between Nigeria and China. Secondly, I think uh, it will provide uh, a platform for people, two countries, people to know each other, to learn from each other. Through this, the mutual understanding can be strengthened and later the bilateral ties can be improved. This uh, film is, uh, is good for the couch exchange. So today we enjoy, I, from your face, I, I believe everybody you are enjoying this, uh, this film. They said, Yulu, you only like live once. And also from this movie, we, we get a lot of that is about Chinese culture. The lady with the perseverance, with the insist, so finally he achieved and he succeeded in his life. The lead character in the movie, who was uh, Lian, yeah? somebody will expect that uh, at a point in her life she should have given up all of the hopes, I say, in energizing herself and coming back again. And it's a cultural thing for Chinese. They always want to prove that they can push to the brink to that very, very level, which is a thing that I think in Nigeria we should also learn to like a cohabit with. It's a thing like push yourself even beyond the limits where the world rejects you at. The movie shows morale, it shows how people struggle to make life uh, from sports to from drama to sports. Uh, it's an interesting package, so it's, it's going to go a long way in the, um, in the broadcasting world. The 2024 Chinese Film Festival in Abuja. Time now to join Yusuf Akogu for business news. Welcome to business news. I am Yusuf Akogu. The Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA, says the private sector can't meet the Nigeria Labor Congress NLC 500,000 Naira minimum wage demand this year or any time soon in light of the Nigeria's economic problems. The group say the private sector remains committed to the previously proposed 57,000 Naira at the Tripartite Committee meeting on the national minimum wage. In a statement on Sunday, NECAS Director General Adewale Smart Oyerinde said the private sector's proposal represents a 90% increase in the national minimum wage. Oyerinde emphasized that the private sector's commitment has remained despite ongoing economic challenges, including rising interest rates, astronomical logistic costs, increasing energy tariffs, and multiple taxes, levies, and fees. Nine listed Nigerian banks' combined operating costs has increased astronomically in the first three months of 2024. According to their latest financial statement, their combined operating expenses jumped to 1.4 trillion naira in the first quarter from 672.7 billion naira in the same period of 2023. Research analysts at CSL stockbrokers Gloria Fadipe say Nigeria's bank's operating expenses have been significantly impacted by inflation leading to higher prices for goods and services. Additionally, personnel expenses have risen due to cost of living, salary adjustment, the removal of first subsidy and the devaluation of the Naira affecting foreign exchange related costs. The stock market opened a week in green as investors renewed hope in equities. Let's see how it went down today. The top gaining equities at the close of business today are John Hurt leading the table there uh, with 9.60% to close at 2 naira and 17 copper per share. Fidelity Bank up there 8.43% to close at 9 naira uh, per share at the close of business today. Corn Oil Nigerian PLC 8.36% it gained to close at 105 naira at the close of business today. Of course, this has pushed up the market by 0.26%. Volume of 359 
5.085 million shares valued at 5.800 billion era in a disc of 7,881 did exchange hands among investors at the close of business this Monday, the first trading day for the week. Of course, top trading equities by volume. We have Access Corporation there, 176.20 uh, 230 million shares to trade. F First Bank of Nigeria PLC, 46. Uh, 0.119 million shares, of course, 20, uh, 21.59 million shares of UBA exchange hands among its investors today. Of course, uh, the losing equities at the close of business are CWG Computer Warehouse Group uh, down 10% to close at 5 naira and 40 copper per share. Capitan Helicopter 10%, 1 naira, 26 copper per share. And the CI leasing down as well, 9.01% to close at 3 naira and 13 copper per share. That's the highlight of stock trading as it went down this Monday on the floor of NGS. Let's see the global stock market and, of course, exchange rate data for today. <music> prices made marginal advances in mooted trade owing to public holidays in Britain and United States after a downbeat week characterized by outlook for U.S. interest rates in the face of sticky inflation. At the London market, Brent coal sells for $82 per barrel. For the paper basket, price drops to $82 per barrel as well. That's business. I am Yusuf Akugu. <music>
necessitating military escorts for relief operations. It's time now to join Adini Ajishafe for the latest in sports. Nigeria's Minister of Sport, John Owa Eno, on Monday visited former Nigeria International Tijani Babangida, who is still recuperating from the accident he was involved in alongside his family members. The minister apologized for visiting late. However, said he has been in touch with Babangida's while thanking the minister for the visit. The Super Eagle star used the opportunity to inform him about the condition of his wife, who needs to be flown abroad for medical attention. The secretary of the Nigerian Players Union, Emmanuel Bayaro, who was on ground to receive the minister, emphasized Babangida's plea for assistance to save his wife through proper medical care. Eno, who assured that the federal government will not abandon Tijani at this trying period, stress that they will ensure that whatever it needs to get back on his feet will be provided. And in marathon, Kenya's Edward Pingua has emerged winner of the symbolic 10th edition of the Kwekwe International Road Race. The 22 year old Kenyan conquered the challenging marathon race in a time of 29 minutes 31 seconds ahead of other runners. His compatriot Isaac Impube came second with a time of 29.36 seconds. 2015 winner Carol Alex Olotiptip, another Kenya finished third with a time of 29.50 in the World Athletics Gold Label event. In the women's category, Gladys Kramboka confirmed the East African's prowess in the middle and long distance races, coming first with a time of 33.05 ahead of the competitor Regina Wambui and Sheila Sheroti, who came second and third respectively. Francis James Musa led the Nigerian male category to finish with a time of 30.46 ahead of Bala Musa and the defending champion Ismail Sajo, who recorded a time of 31 minutes 0.5 seconds and 31.15 seconds respectively. In the women's category, Patient Wong Wang claimed top position with a time of 37.07, .07, while Yulmen Nicolas and Blessing Solomon came second and third respectively. The organizers also carved the category for the Opepe Indigenes. We saw James Raphael, Nasiru Abdullahi, Odama Innocent coming top in the male category, while Omoyaki Success, 13-year-old Okonobi Monica and Omodu Favor were successful in the female category. That's Sport News. I'm Adeni Ajishafe. With that, we have come to the end of the News Hour on Trust TV tonight. Do not forget to follow us across all our media platforms and join our YouTube live stream for more news, programs, and documentary. On behalf of all the hardworking members of team behind the scene, I thank you for watching. I am Eugenia Abu.